going to be like sort of in, you know, MC for this session today. Um, but I, but before we begin, I'm actually going to take a little bit of credit for this one because Mike, I started talking to you, what, like, I think a couple of years ago about doing this webinar, I think, you know, so I've appealed to Mike for a long time to come in and tell his story because he's a great story to tell. So um, we're going to kind of get on with that. Um, for those of you who, on the off chance that you're new to ITSM Academy, we are a full service provider of IT service management related education. So IT service management, ITIL, Agile Lean, DevOps, Site Reliability Engineering. We actually have two active development projects right now. We're launching Observability, which is a new DOI certification in June, and a workplace service excellence skills class in the third quarter. So um, enough of that. Um, we have friends and family here at the Academy and Mike Weaver is one of those people that we count as family. He is uh, one of our authorized instructors. He also has, Mike, how many launches have you been with me? Like, a, I don't know, a couple of you. Yeah, I'm gonna say at least three. <laughs> <laughs> I always say when we launch classes, the people who come, you know, I always explain to them that launches are an adventure, right? Cause it's like, we're shaking out the material for the first time. And uh, Mike is, you know, always kind of up for the adventure. Um, so, um, Mike, let me, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and have you introduce yourself. Again, just we, we really consider you a valued family member and, and uh, all the things you do are the reason why. So tell us about yourself. Well, well, first, Donna, thank you and the ITSM Academy for having me today. It's really an honor to be with you. Um, I guess, you know, um, I, uh, I've been in the industry for a while, so we talked about some of our history, and I'll just start, you know, for me, I started coding um, in high school, uh, and then I went to working uh, in the data center at George Mason University. Uh, that's kind of how I got my start. Uh, after that, I'm, I worked on a couple uh, contracts for the U.S. government, and uh, prior to working for PepsiCo for, for about 20 years, um, I'm currently happily employed with a top global insurance and financial management company. And I think I think part of what's cool about your story is that, you know, think about all those perspectives, right? You do have that kind of developer mindset, having worked in academia, government agency, in a corporate world, and all those are sort of slightly different. So, um, has all of that shaped the way you you view the world that you've seen those different perspectives? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. I think um, like early on in education, you know, um, it was um, you know just so expansive, you know, different types of experiments, learning different things, and then moving into the U.S. government, of course, that was very regimented, um, and you know, it definitely was a different view. Um, so yeah, and then work moving to the uh, corporate sector, uh, definitely, uh, that's where I've had most of my experience. And it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. So you can see from Mike's credentials, and um, I, think, I think it's also one of the things I really respect about Mike is that he has this really broad base of knowledge and experience, you know, exposure to lots of different frameworks. So we actually are going to start there. We're going to start with a poll because um, Mike and I are going to kind of weave our way through talking about uh, lots of different ways of working. So we're going to put our first poll up. And if you all could share what frameworks and approaches you um, are guiding your organization. Um, and Mike, not only, I think it's important, it's worth notice, uh, recognizing that you've been around the idle space for a while, you do idle related education, um, and you also do safe related education as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as you're aware, I, I do train several of the idle four courses, and I'm enabled to train, train the scaled agile courses as well. Right. Uh, yeah, whenever I have a safe question, I call Mike. Like, hey. <laughs> What does safe say about, uh, I told you, Mike, that's on my education plan for this year. I really would like to get a safe certification because I feel like I 
every time I learn something new about it, I'm like, this, this stuff's pretty cool. I really would like to know more. It's pretty cool. I don't even think I know enough to be dangerous. So that's when <laughs> you know that you need to learn more, right? <laughs> well, agree. It's pretty cool. And let me know how I can help. Let me know if I can help. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to give it a couple seconds. Um, and it looks like we have everybody. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. So uh, lots of vital folks out there sharing the results for you, right? The most idle, love seeing IT service management other than idle. So that might be, you know, a homegrown IT service management program. It might be Verisome. Chat your answer in if you've, if you picked ITSM other than idle and tell us if you're using a framework or if you're just, you know, uh, if you just adopted your own approach. Uh, coming in second, Agile Safe. So you're in luck. Those are probably <laughs> the two we're going to talk most about here. Yeah. Um, and then coming in, uh, you know, third and fourth, we've got DevOps and Lean. So uh, awesome. It, it kind of, you know, is right in line with a lot of what we're going to uh, talk about today. I think um, so. So Mike, you and I share something with, in terms of how we refer to each other. You refer to yourself as a process nerd. I refer to myself as a process geek, but I think that put, we're in the same camp, I think. Um, so what what keeps you interested in IT service management? Because you you know you have a, this broad range of experience in that area. What keeps you interested? Well, in, in, in you're right. Management? Yeah, you're right, Donna. I do say I'm somewhat of a process nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I enjoy learning, and our industry is is changing faster than it ever has in the past. I'm I'm also passionate about sharing my knowledge with others. Uh, as we just discussed, I'm certified to train several of the Idle 4 courses as well as the Scaled Agile Framework courses. So do you ever face, you know, a situation in your organizations where you hear the, well, we don't need Idle because we're doing SAFE or we don't need Idle because we're doing DevOps and, you know, this whole conversation around these all conflict with each other. What are what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, too too many times, too many <laughs> times. Um, but you know, they I, I really don't think they conflict. I, I I actually think they support one another. You know, both both start out with a focus on principles for guiding the organization. Um, Idle Idle advises we progress iteratively with feedback, and Safe Safe proposes we build incrementally with fast integrated learning cycles. You know, so that's that's similar to me. Sounds similar to me. Uh, ITIL also highlights uh, guidance to think and work holistically. And SAFE has direction to apply system thinking. Or, or maybe I should have just started with ITIL's principle to focus on value and SAFE supporting that with the principle to organize around value. Again, really, really similar. Yeah, this is, again, something I learned from you. I really wasn't aware that SAFE had a set of guiding principles. And, and yeah, as I was looking at them, I started to try to rearrange them and align them with each other. And then I thought, like, oh, you know, this is one of those moments where I was like, you're spending too much time on this. But <laughs> you, we could absolutely draw, like, yeah. you know. And, and there are some more references, Donna. Um, if you look at the, you know, the, the both of the principles, you can probably do some of those that mapping that you talked about. Right. So I really, you know, if you if you've heard me present before, you, I really think that so much of the, this is culture change. So if you really want to look at changing the culture of your organization, a good place to start is with guiding principles because they help shape the mindset, right? How how people make decisions and approach their work. Yes. So, have you, how, okay. so how, how have you embedded them in the organizations you work? And, and while you're talking, I'm going to kind of launch our second poll. Okay. Well, 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 yes, you know, your guiding principles give you something to fall back on, right? And, you know, they help organizations because, you know, we work in really complex environments today. And sometimes things aren't as clear as we would like them to be. So when we have our guiding principles, we can always rely on them to kind of reset and reset us in a direction that, you know, hopefully we, we're, we're already on the right path that we, we want to head into. Yeah. So we've got our second poll going. 
And uh, I love that we're already seeing some folks say, yes, we've developed our own guiding principles. And I think that's awesome, right? It's yeah. not, these, these are, you know, they're kind of good starting points, but it's like anything else, adopt and adapt and, 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 and kind of shape uh, your own way of doing things. Yeah, well, so, some are going to be sorry. more relevant for your organization than others. Yeah, you, know, you got to figure out what works best for you. Right. So good, you know, pretty off, pretty close in terms of the idol comes out on top, but safe, you know, came in strong. And yes, we've developed our own, which is. Excellent. I'd love to hear from the folks who developed their own. That would be awesome. So if so, if you could chat in, if you've developed your own, did you use the idle and safe ones kind of as a starting point? Did you, and you should, if you want, you know, you can steal shamelessly <laughs> uh, from them, I think. Um, so chat in, if you, uh, if you developed your own, what did, what, what did you base them on? So Let's talk about, you know, some of the things you've done in your organization, because I think, Mike, what I really admire about you and what I, why I encourage you to tell your story is, I think you're like the master of adopt and adapt. Like, we hear that phrase a lot, but it's kind of, you've, you've done it. Like, you know, I've just heard you share example of example. So let's, let's start talking about, you know, how you apply these guiding principles and, and and some of the ways that you've um, kind of improved your practices and processes in your organization. So, um, and, but before we do, let's start out with like, let's be clear about this, that, you know, in talking to you, I appreciate that you, you're not averse to, you know, looking for a quick win now and then, but you, you absolutely have tried to set expectations in your organizations that there's no such thing as a quick fix. You distinguish between those two. Yeah, when and as we were talking before, Donna, you know, you, you first you must recognize there there are no quick fixes, um, and and I'm not saying there's not opportunity for quick wins. Of course, we we often rely on quick wins uh, to support new initiatives. Um, we we must also understand that organizational transformation requires a culture shift and. And changing behaviors takes practice and patience. Um, with that said, um, maybe you were looking for something just a little bit more specific. Um, I, I can give an example where I was look. I was working in an environment um, that had a rapid pace of change and a high volume of incidents that were being caused by change. In many cases, the first reaction when a major incident occurred was to back out all the changes that were implemented the previous day. Uh, sometimes the previous few days. Um, now, we all know that changes can cause incidents. And so this approach did resolve some of the major incidents. Um, but, but can you imagine the time spent uh, backing out and re-implementing changes that were not related to the major incident? Right. Taking a more economic view, another one of those principles we talked about before, uh, we realized that we needed to invest in better impact analysis. And we also needed to increase our focus on quality. Uh, once we started to ensure we had a good understanding of how changes would impact our environments, we were able to reappropriate resources that were previously focused on fighting fires to resources aimed at enabling the organization by providing training and providing, uh, pr providing guidance on operational, uh, operational readiness. Uh, shift left, right? Yeah. It's like That's figure right. out how to build the quality in instead of trying to figure out how to, you know, how to deal with, you know, the impact when we, you know, have incidents caused by change. Very much the shift left approach, Donna. I think, I think also, you know, what I, what I kind of find interesting about this conversation of quick wins versus quick fixes is that you know, quick wins historically are, you know, what can you do quickly that requires, that has the greatest impact with the least amount of effort, but, but the implication is still has impact, right? You're making progress. Quick fixes often translate into workarounds and that sort of thing. 
that translates into technical debt that you're going to pay for somewhere down the line, right? Yeah. It, it all adds, you know, think of all those changes you backed out and how much technical debt you created because you backed something out. That that's exactly correct, Donna. You know, and that's what I was trying to get across with, you know, no quick fixes, because those quick fixes often will uh, cause us to have that technical debt. And it usually takes longer to resolve the technical debt than it would have if you would have just fixed it right in the first place. Right. Or you never get around to fixing the technical debt. And now it's piling up and piling up and piling up. And, you know, at some point it's going to become toxic, right? I've seen that a lot as well. So, you also did a lot of, you've done a lot of work on change management, you know, and, and, I, and I think the more you're around IT service management and idle, I think the more you understand that it's in the integration, right? It's in the process integrations that you really are able to make a difference, right? It's in understanding how incident and change relate to each other um, and, and, and impact each other. But tell us about work you've done in the area of change enablement? Well, you know, I have worked on several change enablement practices in the past, and I, I will admit that, you know, it's fortunate, it's, it's frequently a, a area of opportunity for many organizations. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think many traditional organizations uh, have taken the approach for managing IT changes, uh, have, they have made the change advisory board a requirement. So uh, since we've touched on both the idle and safe frameworks, uh, both take advantage of guidance uh, provided by Lean, uh, where we focus on eliminating waste and increasing flow. So understanding that, my recommendation for many organizations would be to inspect their change practices. Try to identify areas that will pro provide opportunities to increase flow. Um, you should ask questions like, you know, why does the cap exist? Uh, is it to gain the appropriate approvals? Um, if, if, if so, then why do we wait to the cap meeting to get approvals? You know, we should, are we holding the right people accountable? Um, you know, should we be able to get approvals prior to the cap meeting? Um, does the cap exist to provide teams with a way to know what important changes that are coming their way? or maybe it'll cause them impact, um, you know, you should ask again, is there better ways to disseminate this information? Uh, in my past engagement, we did start asking questions like these and we realized that CAB meetings were not required for as many of our changes as we originally thought. Not that CAB meetings weren't required at all, but uh, we didn't have to take everything to the CAB meeting. Uh, yeah. The meetings just weren't providing the quality that we expected. Um, we also started to identify teams that implemented changes with the highest rates of quality. Um, we learned that many of these teams were performing activities like requiring compliance uh, by doing peer reviews and also increasing quality by, by taking a test first approach. When we started rewarding these teams with a faster path to production, somewhat like a bullet train passport option for those teams that were performing the best quality imp implementations. So I love that bullet train um, concept. Um, and, and, I, and what I want you to do is kind of back up a little bit and talk about how you got to the bullet train concept because you you did a value stream mapping effort, yeah? So how, you know, and that's, you know, for any of you who aren't familiar with the concept of value stream, you take it up to, you know, a macro level, you, in your case, you looked at, you know, change management and release management, right? It was, I don't want, you tell your story, but it's, you well, took it up a level and, and, and got a lot of, you know, folks engaged in having that conversation. Yeah, well, what, like I said earlier, Donna, you know, it was somewhat of an expansive program, but um, one of the things that we did to support our fast path to production was to do a value stream map of how many um, approvals that it would be required 
to get something from implement, from development to production. And yes, that value stream map did open up eyes. I think, um, you know, in one example, it was like uh, over 15 approvals just to get something into production. So once you see that, when you see those things on pa paper, they're easier to react to. And then you start to formulate, formulate plans. Again, back on that lean reference, you know, uh, focus on eliminating waste, and that will help us increase our time to value, or right. increase, I guess, our time to value. Um, one of the things we're going we're gonna to touch on a couple of times as we go along is we're going to talk about leadership involvement in, in, in all of this, right? Because you, you know, in, in some ways you have, you know, um, you've done some innovative things, and 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 I know it, you need leadership support to get that. So how did how did you get the leadership support for the value stream mapping initiative? How did you get? Because you have to get all those different stakeholders engaged. How did you make that happen? Well, you know, leaders, you definitely rely on leadership support, and you know, leaders often, you know, have to have to. Um, envision or see where that quality comes from in the end. So that that often is a challenge. Um, I'll also touch on, you know, our, our business partners. Um, you know, you know, you have to look at, you know, you have to make sure you have some type of approach to address your business partners as well as your leadership. So for our business partners, you know, we understood that our business partners were smart. Um, and they they understood um, you know, the time uh, for decreasing time to value. They actually understood it more than IT. Um, and in my experience, we had the most success when we included our business partners early That's and awesome. continued to align and, and, and realign and, and realign <laughs> often. And, you know, you, you have to become one team. You have to become one team. So, Mike, there's a little conversation going on in chat. You know, some folks are saying that you seem to be pointing out the difference between normal and standard changes, right? If we look at from an idle perspective. Um, and someone commented that, you know, standard changes absolutely shouldn't need to go in front of the cab. But even with normal changes, right, you, you did a lot of work in terms of reducing the number of approvals, in terms of delegating those approvals back to the people who were kind of actually doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. That well, was and uh, I think they, uh, the standard versus normal is a good designation there. Not something I was thinking about, <laughs> but I understand how it resonates with some. Um, no, uh, but again, it wasn't something I was thinking about. I was more so talking about the the risk related to normal changes and how, you know, uh, I would see, I would suggest maybe only critical or very high changes that need to have a, some type of forum. You know, I would also, and I would also assume that, you know, there's not a whole lot of those for most organizations. Most of your changes are, you know, even your state changes that are not standard would either be small, medium, uh, even high, right? They wouldn't be critical or very high. So that's right. the designation that I'm talking about is kind of uh, slicing it down another layer and saying, you know, all we don't have to talk about all these normal records in CAV either. Right. Excellent question. Yep. So that's kind of one layer of it is looking at the value stream, looking at the waste that comes into play with things like, you know, approvals and, you know, the different handoffs that you've got. But you also... Um, kind of getting back to the bullet train concept, you introduced a lot of automation in there into that conversation as well, right? Well, I would say when we first started our, our effort to uh, give reward teams for a fast path to production, you know, right, related on quality, um, you know, we, we started using, you know, some of the newer tools that are available in the industry. We started using the uh, CICD pipeline, right? And that's how uh, we started to be able, we, we touched on some of the quality stuff earlier as well. Uh, that's how we started, you know, putting, shifting our, some of our quality checks and our security checks left. So we were accounting for them in, within the development cycle versus waiting to the end and then doing security and quality checks. Right. 
Right. And I think, you know, I always say to, to DevOps practitioners who say, like, we don't need IT service management. My answer always is you're doing IT service management. You're just not calling it that, right? Okay. You're yeah. making changes, you're deploying releases, you're handling incidents, right? You're doing all of this stuff. Um, and all, all that ahead. service managed stuff, service management stuff that people have been doing for 50 years plus. Right. <laughs> And um, so I think, I think, you know, the idea is to dispel this myth that we can't, you know, we can't have either, you know, speed or stability or speed, or I know your organization talks about speed and safety, right? Um, you actually can kind of, the promise of bringing all these bits and pieces together is that you can in fact have it all, yeah? Yeah, well, um, you know, we do not sacrifice, or you should not sacrifice quality for speed. You know, uh, you know as I was just touching on, you know, you you should try to build your quality checks within your development cycle, um, and then you know, at the end, you should see an increase in quality because you've already done your quality checks and security checks. So once you get to the end, you don't have to backtrack and say, "Does this work?" Because you know it works because you tested it throughout the development cycle. Again, that test first type of approach. Right. So this, for anybody who's never seen this chart before, this is from the Accelerate State of DevOps report. And um, you can see that the metrics and these four metrics are very in, you know, widely accepted in the industry, in the DevOps community. And I always have to smile when I see them because there are IT service management metrics, right? And that have been around for a very, very long time. Um, but what I always think is interesting about this is that what, what they have found in studying this, and they first started studying these metrics going back to 2014, is that you see in low performing organizations where they get focused on speed and, you, and, and over on the right-hand side, you see this, but they get so focused on speed that they sacrifice quality and all of a sudden the incident count goes through the roof. Look at the, look at the change failure rate, right? In the low performing organization. So yeah, maybe you're going faster, but you're slam dunking poor quality stuff into the production environment, right? So the higher the performance gets, the more you bring all these bits and pieces that you're talking about, right? Improved change management, improved development practices, things like CI, CD practices, the better you get at bringing all of those pieces together, the more capable you are of having it all. So I think it's, I love this set of metrics because it presents that balanced perspective, right? It's, we're bringing together incident and change metrics and, and, and making sure that, uh, again, we're not sacrificing one thing for another. Well, and, and Donna, you, you asked about leadership support uh, earlier. This data that we're sharing right now is the type of the data that we have to put in our leaders' hands. It allows them to make appropriate decisions. Right. And it hopefully helps them understand things from the customer experience level, especially if we're on the right hand side. You know, if they're if they're totally focused on speed and all you're hearing from leadership is about speed, 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 at some point you have to present them with the facts that okay, we're going faster, but look at the impact on our customers. That, if, if, if they're not hearing about it already directly from the customers, right? Faster does not necessarily mean better. Better, exactly, exactly. And we are way beyond the, what was that old adage, like pick two, right? <laughs> um, it's like with cheaper, better, faster, pick two. Well, no. The business that's not going to fly right with your business partners. It, it it's it's more so pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> <laughs> so you've also done a lot of interesting work in the area of problem management. Talk to me about what you've done with problem management. Well, I think one of the more innovative. Uh, approaches that I was involved in was an experiment to combine resources that manage the major incidents 
and the problem records into one team. Uh, in most environments uh, that I've seen, problem records are open once the incident record is closed and different, a different set of resources start working to identify the root cause. Uh, in, in this experiment that I was engaged in, the root cause investigation remained with the same team that was managing the restoration activities. Uh, they had the better, they had the best understanding of the activities related to the incident, and this reduced investigation time. So it it seemed to be working for for the team. I don't think I've ever asked you this question before. It like it popped into my head just now. Um, maybe I've asked you this question before. Do you have any targets for how quickly your kind of root cause analysis work does? Your you know how quickly that investigation work gets done? Uh, of, of course, um, and I'll say in, it's in several environments that I've worked for in the past, we've talked about the there's a best practice to set targets, right? And especially to make sure that those restoration or those um, research activities are happening. So in many cases, once we stop feeling the pain of that incident, then we lose the focus, right? It's restored, business is restored, everybody's back up and running, and we don't focus on making sure that that incident doesn't recur again. So, um, so uh, in that uh, experiment that I was talking about, uh, uh, we really focused on those major incidents, those things that were higher priority, and made it a requirement that they had a a uh, root cause investigation, right? And, you know, you know, in our real world, Donna, you know, sometimes there are experiences that we won't find the root cause, but in most incidents, um, although they may be complex, right? Several things that came together at the same time that caused that unique incident, there usually is some type of trace that, that may be an improvement opportunity for us that we can get better at so we don't let this thing, this same thing, impact us in the same way again. Right. Have you, uh, so you've got, you've got these folks who are involved in handling the major incident and then you trans, um, transition them to problem management activities. I've, what have you provided any type of training to help these folks understand how to do things like and root cause analysis? I just did a blog on this uh, about the aversion in some communities today the term root cause analysis. So I think there's you know I say in my blog maybe we call it probable cause analysis instead of root cause because yeah. people seem to like hate the word root like that's what everybody gets all up in arms about. But um, have, what kind, you know, have you provided folks education or do you have any particular kind of methodical approaches that you're using for those problem management activities? So there are, you know, again, in many of those circumstances, I think training is made available. I'll speak for specifically for, um, you know, the SAFE framework. It does uh, reference the Ichikawa uh, Fishbone framework. And it's um, you know for the problem management meeting, and you know it is a a event that is focused on identifying the largest problem that are uh, impacting your agile release train, and making sure that you are putting them back in your backlog. So you put some uh, focus, some focused resource time on again making sure those those problems, those issues, those concerns don't have a negative impact on your agile release train going forward. Right. And I think, so for anybody who's not familiar with Ishikawa diagramming, it's often referred to as fishbone diagramming. And um, I think one of the things that's cool about Ishikawa is it does kind of challenge you to look at multiple, you know, areas in terms of probable cause. I, I think sometimes people push back on five whys because they it takes you down one path. You go, you think, okay, what is the technical issue? Why is that a technical issue? And you focus, you put your little blinders on, you focus on that one, that one chain of thought. Whereas Ishikawa, you could look at, you know, were there people related issues, were there process related issues, were there technology issues, were there like think and work holistically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, and I love that you're talking about then taking what you identify out of that and putting it back into the backlog, right? 
so that hopefully somewhere along the line that work gets prioritized. Yeah, yeah, that that's the way it's supposed to work. So <laughs> yeah. again, it's it's continuous as well. But it again, it requires that it it, it requires that leadership support, and it's you know it it's just the one you know. It's just one of the many challenges we face. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put up the next poll, and and let's talk about this this notion of like the challenges um, that organizations are facing and how they are dealing with them. So I'll ask you this question, Mike. While everybody's looking at the polling question, what was the biggest impediment that you faced? in terms of increasing the flow of value in your organization and 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 kind of how did you deal with it and 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 maybe what impediment are you working on now well i'll say you know some of the challenges that you know are are somewhat persistent in in most of the engagements that i've been in and it you know we've already touched on leadership support so you you have to make sure you have the right leaders and you know i've been very fortunate to to have some leaders that had an understanding of service management and also uh leaders that have had uh understanding of agile ways of working so but you know so uh you have to um as I said earlier, give your leaders some of that information that we previously shared today uh, so they can have a better understanding and allow them to, to, to make the correct decisions. Um, the next one um, I'll say is, you know, uh, you just touched on making sure that people have the right level of training, right? Um, you know, everything that we do is based on people, right? So uh, people need, um, you know, different types of training for uh, technical, um, social, uh, economical, um, you know, you have to make sure you're meeting your employees needs um, and giving them the skills that they are needed to, to require, that they require to be successful. So I think we've oh, and, and Oh, and you said in some that, you know, may be present today and, you know, um, I'll just say, um in today's world uh a lot of what i see is um breaking down organizational silos so i was just gonna say to you that so that came out first right oh so, okay i yeah. see it now you, i see it can you speak yeah. to that yeah so I, yeah well i'm glad thank you for the segue somewhat <laughs> but yeah that that's that's not unique to any you know type of industry any specific type of organization uh, for many of us, and I include myself in that us, we were uh, we were designed to do that development and then the test and then the QA and then any other type of resilience and then any type of quality. You know, we were built to be segregated that way and we worked that way for a very, very long time. And so that concept of having all those skills present in one team is somewhat hard to accept for some people. Um, so, you know, that that's one of the challenges I think many organizations are still facing. I think we were talking about this uh, recently. We were talking about, you know, SAFE has this organized, organized around value guiding principle. And you were talking about that, that a true cross-functional team is something that's very easy to say, but a lot more difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just as I was just speaking to, right, you, we, we say that everything from the, to, the, to get us from design to production uh, should reside in one agile team. So like you just said, it's really easy to say, um, but in practice, you know, it's, it's hard to have all of those skills in a, you know, I think SAFE says 11 to 13 or 9 to 13 member team. Um, so, um, again, that's a challenge for many organizations. Uh, I see some pivoting and, you know, you, you, you are where you are in your, mature, your, your, your maturity journey, right? So I see some organizations pivoting and supplementing um, you know, centralized teams, like I have a centralized set testing team and I loan out resources to whatever team that needs testing resources. Um, what I've seen, it, it appears to be working, but it is a shift from that 
uh, scaled agile guidance to have everything in one team. So um, again, I think it uh, reinforced, you know, all of us where are where we are in our current maturity level. And I believe if you have that luxury to have all that within that um, small team, then I think that's, it's great because, you know, it does give you a, a level of um, customer support that most don't have. And from a customer support, I always am fascinated with this conversation. From a customer support perspective, even when you have a true cross-functional team, our customers, you know, and, and, and let's use our vocabulary, our users actually calling into these teams when they have questions and issues, or are these teams still on the back end of a process that maybe originates at the service desk? With yeah, well, I, I would say my experience is number two, Donna. There's still some type of mechanism to get that issue, that ticket to that team. Um, the, the difference is it, it doesn't go through some of the other traditional service management activities where one team does this piece and one team does this piece. You know, it, all of those support activities from the um, the investigation to restoration to ever whatever change and release uh, enablement practices or activities I have to follow, all are done in that self-sufficient team. Right. So um, I, I want to say, um, <clears throat> I've been kind of like following the chat. If anybody has any questions you'd like to ask Mike directly, Go ahead. We've got. We're coming into the time when 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 we can do that. We've got a couple more things to talk about. But if you have questions for Mike, please take advantage of the fact uh, that he's here and uh, go ahead and and ask your questions. So, um, I think it's interesting. Our our folks, you know, organizational silos, resource constraints also came up, came in pretty strong. Which I think, given where we are you know, with everything that's going on in the economy and, and so forth, you know, we're hearing about the layoffs, we're hearing about the tightening of belts, we're in one of those periods of time. So I think it, I, whenever these types of situations occur, my thought always is, here's where things like lean really come into play, where can uh, work on eliminating your waste and keeping your people, <laughs> right? Um, why do you think, you know, why do you think we tolerate so much waste in our processes, Mike? Do you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, well first, you know, resource constraints are, are real, right? Um, I've already talked about people, right? We can't get what we do done without people. So right. resource constraints are real. Um, <clears throat> uh, for your question, you know, I think um, you know, a lot of times we are we're just comfortable. Right, we are comfortable doing things the way that we've always done it, and so much so we don't even question why do we do things that way. Um, you know, that was one of you know as we talked about a little bit earlier, that was one of the things that the value stream uh, highlighted er, uh, that we touched on earlier. Um, that we were getting all of these approvals, and some of them we didn't even understand why uh, they were put in place. And and even with that, we start asking people. Uh, the the people who were providing the approvals, and I mean, they were still providing the approvals, right? When needed, we were asking them, well, why were they providing the approvals? And they weren't sure. They had no idea why they were providing the approval. It was something that they had either requested because of something happened in a moment in time, so they wanted that increased visibility, or it was inherited. It, somebody gave it to them, and right. they, they had to do it, so they just kept on doing it. And so we start questioning if it was valuable. We got back a lot of no's. We got back a lot of no's. It wasn't valuable. That's awesome. And that's real, right? Like, it's a throwback to the person who had that job before them was like a control freak and felt like they needed to approve everything. Didn't really. Or yeah, somebody did some, somebody made a mistake, you know, even if it's an honest view and mistake and the knee jerk reaction was add in another layer of approval, like how much of that do we have uh, in our organizations? Right? And, and then that becomes the work, right? Somebody inherits that and thinks, well, it's the way it's always been done. So I guess I need to do it too. Exactly. Uh, so, so there's a question that you've, you know, you've worked in a lot of amazing organizations. You've, you know, 
that idea of having seen academia, having seen government, having seen the corporate world. Have you seen the same low hanging fruit in the in all these organizations that you've worked for? And what would you suggest in terms of good quick wins to start with? So awesome what, question. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what what was the second part of that question? Have you seen the low hanging fruit? Same yeah. low hanging fruit. Yeah. And what are good quick wins? To good quick wins. Do? Okay. So it's kind um, of twofold. Yeah. Okay. So um and the first part of the question, definitely yes. Uh, every organization that I've worked in, from private sector to government to academia, all had opportunities for quick wins. Um, now, the second part of the question, there is no silver bullet, <laughs> right? Um, I'll say one of the things that will help you identify your quick wins is the value stream mapping. So if you don't have any experience with value stream mapping, it is outlining the activities that will get you from your demand to value, to customer receiving your value. And when you map out those steps, you often will see long queue lengths, you'll often see uh, extended wait times. And those are the things that you wanna, uh, those are some of your, will be some of your opportunities for some quick wins. So um, again, there's no, if you do, it, this is a quick win type of answer, but value stream mappings will give you a good avenue, a good avenue for finding them. Right. It, it's often said that part of what, part of the value value stream is you look at the white spaces between your activities, you know, because a lot of times people have their blinders on and they look at the work they do. And so, yeah, you can say, well, it takes me, I don't know, 10 minutes to complete this task. But if there's like a half, half an hour or multiple hours of wait time before the next person can work on their task, it's all that white space, right? Where, where stuff really, or that's where you're waiting for approval, or that's where you're waiting for something to work its way through its queue. So, and a lot of times you don't see that until you map it out because everybody's like thinking about their thing. Well, yeah. it it really does make those wait times and queue lengths visible, right? So when you look at the actual work time from getting something something done versus the time it's waiting between each step to get it done, it's an eye opener. It's an eye opener for many. And you've, I mean, I I'm not going to get the numbers right. You'll get them right for me. But you've had situations where you've gone from I don't know twenty seven days lead time down to 21, 20 days lead time, right? You've 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 been able to knock a significant amount of time off. Yeah, um, you know, well, for different you know situations, you know, I've seen reductions up to you know forty days, um, and making sure that we were you know uh, producing or releasing quality, um, releasing enhancements uh, instead of quarterly um, every two to three weeks. So okay. um, definitely, and and okay. a lot of that was related to not having the handoff to another team to do this and another team to do this. Again, another plug for those, those self-sufficient teams, right? If I can do all those, all those activities in one team, then it saves me the time from transferring it to this queue, to the next queue and on to the next queue. Right. Well, and I like, it's kind of what I like about your fast path or bullet train philosophy is they earn the right, right? To, to, to use that approach. They have to prove, right, that they're not just quickly making poor quality changes. They have to prove that all these pieces have come together. They're, they're, they can move quickly and safely and, you know, ensure stability in the production environment and restore service very quickly if something does happen to go wrong, like, right? They yeah, have to prove I'll, it all up. I'll use my really technical terms. They can't break things. <laughs> <laughs> and can they lose their passport oh definitely yeah um so and it is uh doesn't have very much fault tolerance um you know if you are creating incidents then you can use your lose your 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 password um and um that but of course you know we try to enable teams so we um you, we want to make sure there's some type of problem process that it leads you to the the remediation or the mitigation the the comfort that 
we won't do this. We, we, we won't create this incident the same way. So we understand that machines break. Sometimes our quality checks uh, will fail us, right? right? So incidents are gonna happen uh, in our complex environments. But we, again, much of the goal is not having the same incident causing us the same pain. Good segue. So learn, <laughs> learn from failure, right? Yes. Learn yes. from failure and learn from everything you do. And this is something I know you're very committed to lifelong learning. Uh, I know you serve as a mentor in terms of encouraging young people to learn. Talk about your passion about education and learning. Oh, well, Donna, you know, uh, uh, agreed. You know, I consider myself a, a lifelong learner. Um, you know, I, I um, as I said in my opening, one of the things that I enjoy most is sharing my knowledge with others. Uh, yes, I, I am a proud mentor and partner for, for some of my colleagues. Um, also, um, you know, uh, I've been involved in, you know, big brother, big sister activities. And um, I uh, was a actually a founding partner in an in a organization called Brother to Brother, which was uh, mentoring for teenage boys. So uh, I've gotten a lot of enjoyment out of that space. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, I too, I'm, I'm worried about the teens. I, I, I think we need to help our teens these days. I think they, uh, I think they're struggling a little bit. So I'm with you on that one. And I think a lot of them are, you know, it's so interesting because some of them are, they're kind of all into coding and they think it's all about coding and they like, we need to help them understand that that code goes somewhere yeah, <laughs> and there's a customer on the end of that code, and you know that code can break, and somebody has to fix it when it breaks, and you know. Well, and and they do seem to to have a different set of challenges than than we did, John Donna. They yeah. do, right? Exactly. Yeah. So what else? What's the future hold for you? What's your next uh, the next exciting thing you're working on? Well, you know, always looking for things and 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 areas to improve right you know it's um you know i've i've i know i've said in in some of my training classes you know especially when we're talking about those some of those lean things and uh the biggest constraint then uh you know when we address that biggest constraint what do we get rewarded with we get right. rewarded with the next biggest constraint, right? Yeah, the next exactly. thing is there for us to work on. So uh, for me, you know, I work in a really exciting environment right now. Um, and, you know, I believe my environment, as well as, you know, many others, there's always that next exciting thing to work on uh, if you look for it a little bit. Right. And I know um, you've worked for organizations that have, um, you know, strong you know, commitments to digital and, and, and you've li you're living through digital transformation in these organizations. And I know you've worked for companies that have strong sustainability commitments. So I kind of want to just put it out there to everybody. If you, if you weren't paying attention to the date, Earth Day is this Saturday. Um, I'm excited that um, a high percentage of CEOs today are very, very committed to sustainability. And um, IT plays an important role in that, um, in terms of looking at how we're procuring technology, how we're supporting technology, how we're reusing the technology. Um, and I'm gonna ask you one more quick question and then I've got one more polling question we're gonna do. I know you, for example, the IT asset management process is one of those processes that plays a strong role in um, sustainability initiatives. I know you you mentioned you've got a kind of ITM CMDB project going on. So everybody's out there wondering about CMDB. I know that's something you're working on right now as well, right? So I, I will say, Donya, for me, <laughs> and I, I, I actually hope this isn't for most, but for me, uh, almost uh, every organization I've worked with has continued to try to get better at managing their assets in some type of way. And so, um, 
you know, uh, I think it's really, really hard to to manage your services, your products and services, if you don't have a good handle on your your configuration, how your assets um, are put together to provide that service, as well as the uh, financial management of your assets to make sure that you have the correct number of licenses and, you know, you're not overusing and getting penalties and things like that. Right. Um, but, you know, just to broaden it a little bit, you know, since it is Earth Day this Saturday, you know, I'll, I'll reinforce that you know, I've been really fortunate to work with several leaders in my career that understood the importance of sustainability. Uh, they've understood the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also understood the importance of creating a healthier planet. Um, right. I think many associates look for these qualities today. And so sustainability is quickly becoming a expectation for organizations. Right. And I, I think that's a great thing. I think yeah. many leaders do already recognize that. Yeah, we talk about that in digital and IT strategy that it's, you know, sustainability is not, it's often equated with environmentalism, but it's also the social aspects of things, uh, the DI, DI things and economic revenue. So like, let's look at having, you know, all three of those things. We, we can't, um, again, sacrifice one for the other. Triple so, bottom line. Um, the, what triple bottom triple line? Bo exactly. Triple bottom line. Like, we yeah. learned that in digital <laughs> strategy. Like, was that our favorite class or what? I personally that, love that class. I know you like that class as well. So we're, yeah, that we're, is we're, we're that making... is a uh, you know uh, just being the CIO of your own organization. You know that that <laughs> excitement yeah. to your class. Yeah, it's a super fun class. So anybody who's interested, uh, Mike teaches it. I teach it. Uh, it's a super fun class. Uh, so. Just in the last couple of minutes, uh, I want to mention that um, we are, as always, working on expanding our portfolio. And if you haven't heard, ITIL um, PeopleSearch, uh, who owns the ITIL portfolio, has introduced um, new practice manager clusters and practice manager courses. So if you all will indulge us, we're going to do two quick little polls just to kind of get a read on how you're feeling about this stuff. So the way the clusters work, they are three-day classes that cover five practices, and you can see the cluster is kind of here. Um, or um, there are one-day classes where you would cover one practice. So just a kind of quick poll of, you know, giving your choice between those two, uh, which would you prefer? And as much as it killed me, I had to put it in, it depends because I think that's just our universal IT service management response to things. Um, but so far, nobody's picked it depends. So that's, that's cool. So I'm going to just give it one more second. Let everybody answer. I think we've got everybody. Thank you. We see some folks uh, slowing down, slowing down. All right. So uh, kind of the, by the nose, uh, we're seeing, you know, that idea of a one-day class, which doesn't surprise me. We're all so busy in this day and age that, you know, small, short blocks of education, you know, just in time, right, is hopefully the uh, perfect scenario. And then um, the second, the next poll that we would like to ask you is relative to that first um, cluster. Oops, sorry. Come on, Donnie, you can do it. Um, and this is a ranking question. So if we can get you to rank um, of these practices, of these five practices that are part of the monitor, support, and fill cluster, which, which is the most attractive to you? And while folks are, are answering those polls, um, let me just say thank you, Mike. For, uh, for coming, you, I, I can stop bugging you now. <laughs> we can talk about other things. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you in the ITSM Academy for having me. It's, it's been my pleasure. I appreciate it. I, uh, you know, I think the fact that you, um, you know, some of the things you've done, like your bullet train concept and trying to really create this fast path into production, how you're integrating incident problem management. I mean, I think these are things that we need I, always, I said this, like, I think the more you can integrate your processes, the better off you're going to be, right? Because the story is in how you integrate things. 
Yeah. And I think you do a good job of telling that story. Go ahead. Well, and just, you know, just reinforcing a lot of what we've, we've, what, what I've done in the past is, is look on how to increase flow, right? It just made um, sense to combine those two teams and at least try it, right? Um, so far, it's been pretty fruitful for us. Um, awesome. So no surprise, Mike, you know, folks are saying, wish we could hear more about that ITM CMDB project. <laughs> <laughs> So stay tuned. Maybe that'll be part two of our, maybe that'll be like next year. We'll do the, you know, your, your CMDB journey, because I think you're right. I think that's, those are two processes that organizations, is it fair to say rarely get right the first time? I mean, is that an unfair statement? Or, I would say that. Like, yeah. I would say that's fair. And, you know, what I've seen is uh, organizations traditionally try to bite off more than they can consume that first attempt. Uh, so start small, work iteratively, and get better over time. Right. So somebody said, so sad, change isn't on the list. Oh, I, yeah, because it's not in that first module. We only included the processes that are in the first module. But thank you, Robin, for saying that, that we, you know, you're right, that change, if you look, change is in the plan, implement, and control module. So right now, only the monitor support and fulfill module has been launched. The other two are kind of coming soon later at the end of the year. So thank you for that question comment, right? All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you everybody for attending today. I'm not seeing, I'm seeing Mike, amazing presentation. Thank you, Mike, right? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Excellent presentation, capital letters, right? So. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not at all surprised to hear that kind of feedback. I, I, I knew uh, everybody would love you as much as we do here at the Academy. So uh, thank you again. And uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon uh, offline. Th thanks again for having me, Donna. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great one.